So we're really pleased to start off with Rich Perry, who's an alumni of the department, graduated 10, 15 years ago or so. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, and his wife, Lisa, also is a, is a graduate of the department in geology. Rich went on uh, initially doing exploration and then ended up at University of Nevada, Reno to, for his graduate work and has moved through the ranks and is now a, a top administrator, I guess I can say that, right? Sure. At the Nevada Division of Minerals. Um, and when we say Nevada Division of Minerals, I don't want to steal too much thunder from this talk. It, it's more than just gold and silver exploration. It's energy, it's geothermal, and it's looking into all the resources of the state. And so we appreciate Rich coming back to support his alma mater. Thanks. Thanks. Can you see it well from back there? Don't need to dim the lights or anything. Yeah, but it's always an honor to come back, and it's always fun to come back to Chico, where, where my wife and I met in the geology department when this guy was a professor back then teaching mineralogy. And uh, we always make our, our way through here at least once a year uh, and, and enjoy coming by. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I have a presentation today on general energy, which I think you'll find interesting. Uh, and this is this is a presentation on exploration, development, and production in Nevada. So it's kind of going to be the whole gamut. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about geology and why there's geothermal uh, uh, exploration and production in the state of Nevada and how that works and how wells are drilled and, but I'm also going to talk about how the plants actually run which I think is really interesting because because this whole industry has really evolved over the last 30 or 40 <coughs> years now um, and I'll, I'll point out as we go through the pictures here just just so you can kind of get a, get a flavor for it uh, this this is out in Nevada, right? Uh, I think it's at the Tungsten Mountain Field that's being drilled right now about six months ago, and those are geothermal drilling rigs. They're drilling geothermal wells. They look a lot like oil drilling rigs because, uh, because a lot of times they use oil drilling rigs to drill these. They're, they're large diameter, deep orbital rigs. So just, you know, the terms geo-earth and thermal heat, heat from the earth, and, and that's actually looked at a little differently from state to state. California actually has a a, a requirement that the temperature has to be this before it's considered to be geothermal. Nevada doesn't have that, so actually geothermal is considered if you drill a, a, a hole in the ground and put a heat exchanger in it and have a ground source heat pump, it's considered geothermal. Even though there's no heat, you're cooling with it in the summer and heating in the winter. So there's some nomenclature there regarding that that's, that's evolving, and that's a, that's a geothermal plant out in Nevada that you see right in the background there. So the simple geology to these, and uh, this is simple because it's not so simple as you get into the real exploration part of it. It's just this, you, you have meteoric water that's moving through the ground, and it's going down and it's getting heated by rocks at some depth, and then it's coming up along some types of, of structure, and as we'll see in Nevada, those are, those are typically range from faults. Um, why is Nevada a good place to look for, for geothermal? Because it has a relatively thin crustal thickness versus most other places, like if you're in the Midwest out there in Nebraska, your crustal thickness is much thicker than it is in, in Nevada. And that is because we are in a province that are called the Basin and Range Province. And, and you can see the, the, uh, the area here of, of high, um, of high heat flux, and this, and this would be a good cross section across Nevada right here, going, going here. It's the Basin and Range Province. So, Nevada tectonically is pulling apart between the Sierra Nevadas and over towards Salt Lake City. It's, it's being pulled apart and has for the last 30 million years or so. So the mountains rise and the valleys drop down. How many of you have driven across Nevada, say I-80 or 50? Yeah. So you've seen it. It's kind of a wide open expanse. The highways go through the valleys, but there's mountain ranges in between. So as it's pulled apart, the crust got thinner out there, allowing for um, those hot rocks to be closer to the surface and access by meteoric waters that work their way down through there. Borrow this slide from Jim Falls, who's the uh, administrator for the Bureau of Lines and Geology uh, out of Reno there, because I thought it was a really good one to, to show a little bit about a nice 3D diagram here of a geothermal resource here. The, the depths by which these resources are reached are anywhere somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 feet. And you see here two, two straws in the ground, right? 
you see a geothermal production well that's drilled into the reservoir here, and then you and then you also see a geothermal injection well here, because in, in the geothermal business, hot water is pumped to the surface in in the in the um, part of the geothermal industry where they're generating electricity and for space heating, and then the heat is removed from the water, and then the water is pumped back into the ground to be reheated by the rock again. So it's literally like the earth is a boiler down there heating heating the rock, and they become very good at at the reservoir engineering of that, which I'll talk about in a little bit of determining how how long of a cycle it takes. They run tracer tests to see how long the cycle takes for the for the water to come back up the uh, well bore for the production well again. So initially, um, 30 years ago or so, when they really started doing exploration in Nevada, probably 40 years ago in California, because the geysers was the first big geothermal field in, in California, and that's over in Lake County. And I actually did a summer while I was here working as a mud logger at the geysers, so it was fun to, to see those geothermal wells drilled and, and um, and see the steam coming out of the ground going to all the power plants over there. Um, but they initially focused on areas where there was hot springs, right? Because the hot, hot springs is the surface, the surface uh, exposure of, of meteoric water that's heated that comes to the surface, usually via a fault, not, not all the time, but typically structurally controlled. And hot springs deposits, uh, at least in Nevada, you commonly see them out there along range fronts, and you'll see what's called center deposits on top of them, these silica blankets that are sort of white. If you've been south of Reno to Steamboat Springs, the, the highway actually goes through a big center deposit there at Steamboat Springs, and there's four or five geothermal plants <coughs> operating there. But in the last 10 years, as they, as they found what they could looking at surface hot springs and unraveling the geology, they started to look for blind geothermal systems. And the term blind just means that there was no hot springs on the surface, there was no center deposit necessarily, um, there was nothing geologically, other than maybe some alteration mapping that would indicate that there might have been a geothermal system active in that area. So, so how, have they, how have they looked for those? With geophysical techniques. And there's a, a, a plethora of those, and I'm not going to try and explain them all here, but, but you, you may have come, come across and read about some of these ele electrical resistivity, gravity surveys to determine you know, the, the specific gravity of the rock below the surface, magnetic and aeromagnetic surveys to, to look at the, the magnetic um, component of the, of the rock that's beneath the surface, and then seismic reflection methods, which is what they use in oil, where they bounce uh, energy waves off and then look at the layers of rock or, or in this case, in many cases, where, where the alluvium ends and the bedrock begins. So, with, with those different methods, um, they, they did a study at the Bureau back in 2005, and it was called the Kulbach Study, and it, and it had a map of central Nevada here. You can kind of see the outline of, of Nevada right going here. So here's California over here. This is the major geothermal production area in the, in the state there. And he compiled a number of different things of the geophysical uh, data that was out there, gra gravity, uh, looking at strain rates, uh, temperature gradients, uh, the earthquake frequencies. You know, in Nevada, there's lots of seismometers everywhere. And Nevada constantly has little earthquakes, just like California. They might be, you know, Richter 1, Richter 2, you don't feel them but they're logging them constantly to look at where there's actual movement down there, indicating the, 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 uh, the presence of faults. Um, and they produced uh, this map in 2005, which has been used as the exploration map, largely for, for uh, uh, geophysical exploration for the past, what, 11 or 12 years. So that was updated uh, in 2015 uh, by the Bureau uh, with with what they call their fairway map, which, which I kind of like to, to look at here, and that's what this map right here is of Central Nevada, where they took all of that evidence as well as the um, uh, evidence that they had from actual drill holes that looked at temperatures and thermal gradients in those drill holes, um, surface geology, and overlaid that with some physical things like 
uh, the Highway 50 corridor, the I-80 corridor, and where the transmission lines are in the state of Nevada, the power transmission lines. And, and I'll, that'll come to light a little, a little later when we talk about how that fits into the whole exploration scheme out here. So this is a little bit better view of the map here that you can see. And uh, the Bureau, the Bureau uh, like I said, produced that with a DOE grant here a couple years ago, and they call it the fairway map because of these blocks here being being the very high probability exploration areas for, for geothermal power production exploration. So I'm gonna spend a little time on this one because I, I like this one, it kind of explains the detail of, of, of how how some of that geophysics then results in an exploration target. This is actually the Blue Mountain Geothermal Field, which became an active geothermal field. It's in northern Humboldt County, so there's a power plant out here now. Blue Mountain's up, up in this direction here. What you see here is an active well being drilled and a pad where a well was drilled. And this is the cross section of that. And, and what you see here is Blue Mountain over here, so this is bedrock, right? This is the alluvium in the valley down here because what they're drilling on right there sitting on is an alluvial fan that probably has several hundred feet at least to right there of, of gravels and sands and so forth that overlay this and their geophysics you know led them into this area uh, I know because this was a blind target to try to drill to try to drill and see if they could intersect a range front fault of which there was a number of them there's actually a small graben here of of faulting, but but this well here that they're drilling was a non-productive well because as you can see it drilled right into the bedrock pretty quickly and it never intersected a ridge front fault. I think these wells were somewhere around five to six thousand feet deep in there in when they were drilled. But this one was actually a production well because it did intersect the major controlling structure here for the geothermal system. You know, the, the things that are required for, for an active geothermal system, they're not just hot rocks, but those rocks have to be permeable. They have to have a decent transmissivity, which those of you who are hydrologists, I'm sure, understand the ability of the rock to transmit water through it. And, and as it transmit, transmits through the fractures and so forth in the rock, it is heated by the hot rock, then it has the ability to work its way into one of these faults here. Because the volumes of hot water that are pumped out of these wells a typical well might be 2,000, 3,000 gallons per minute. So, so that's that's a pretty good sized well, and that means that the system around it has to be very permeable for the for the water to move through. There's a lot of hot rocks out there. You know, if you if you remember the last oil well we drilled in the eastern part of the state at 10,000 feet, it was 350 degrees at the drill bit when they quit quit drilling it, which is why they quit drilling it because oil doesn't exist when it gets that hot. It was cooked away years ago. But in, the, but in the case of uh, geothermal, if, if you have hot rocks and no water, you have no system. And uh, there's plenty of warm rocks out there that people have drilled holes into, but if there's no water to go with it, then it doesn't work. So I think that's a good diagram there just to kind of show you, because this was real, and this was the geology that was interpreted from those drill holes. Make sense? Okay. Guys, jump in if you have a question. You can just slow down here. Yeah. So what you just said about if you have hot rocks but no water, can you just add the water yourself or is the idea that there's no space for the water if there's a certain water there? If you can create a permeability in the rock, and then te technically you could add. You can't just add water to a rock that has a very low transmissivity because it won't flow through the rock. Not enough fractures, it's sealed. Um, or, poor, or poor permeability and transmissivity. So if you drill down and you find, and it is permeable, there's probably going to be water there already, so you're just looking for water instead of water. You're looking for hot rocks and water, and a structure that's big enough to carry the, the yield of that, of that well. So all of those sort of go together, which makes geothermal to me a little bit of geology, you know, hydrology, and uh, a fair amount of mechanical engineering, you know, to, to, build, to case the well. Now, as I'll, I'll show you a little later on, one of the research efforts that's going on right now is how to create that permeability in the rock, much like they do in hydraulic fracturing in oil, by, by water fracturing the rock. And they're, they're testing that now because if they could perfect that, then all those places where there's hot rock, if they could, if they could get some uh, in 
get some water into it and start recirculating it, it would really open up a lot of exploration areas that, that have already been drilled and where we know there are hot rocks. Okay. So how do they start this type of exploration? Initially, they go in and drill what are called temperature gradient holes, and they do that with narrow boreholes, usually eight inch, eight inch to 10 inch boreholes. Uh, they're not cased. A borehole is a hole in the ground that has no casing in it. So you're drilling, you're drilling a hole. It could be a core hole, uh, it could be a rotary hole. You're sampling the rock, but you're not putting steel in like you would a water well. Um, and when they're through with those gradient holes, they go back and they, and they cement them in or they clay them in and, and plug them. But they do that so that in the area where they think that there might be a geothermal resource, so that they can run temperature probes down and look at the thermal gradient from the surface. So, so as they lower that temperature probe down there, and they usually do that with some types of geophysical tools, they'll take some other data along with that on a wireline geophysical tool. But as if the temperature gradient you know, indicates that it's rising rapidly as it goes down, then it's an indication that you probably have a geothermal resource or at least hot rocks down there, right? They generally do not penetrate the actual um, geothermal resource because they're unlined boreholes and you wouldn't want to do that because you could have steam blowing up in an unlined borehole. Uh, and then they follow that up with what's called a observation well, which, which is a, a, a borehole that they actually line with, uh, with casing and uh, keep open so that they can up, do observations of the, of the water level and other geophysical methods, but uh, observation wells typically do penetrate the groundwater. Um, the temperature gradient holes typically do not. If, if they find what they're looking for, or if they have favorable geology of what, what, what comes out of the data they collect, then they'll start drilling a production well, and that's what those big wells were, with the big drill wigs that I, that I showed you there earlier. And some of those production wells become injection wells as they unravel the geology, so some of them pump water up, and are used as reinjection wells, uh, and 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 uh, sometimes that moves around a little bit as they learn about the geothermal resource and reservoir engineering. So, what do those drill rigs look like? The one on your left there is a is a truck mounted uh, exploration rig. Those are typical as you're driving around in Nevada, particularly in the summer, because they do mineral exploration with them. But they also use them for these temperature gradient holes and observation wells. Um, those types of rigs also drill, drill, drill water wells. You've probably seen them around here. Kind of look like that. A little bit different equipment on them. They can drill to maybe 2,000 feet, somewhere in that range. The one on the right there is a production rig. That's actually Ormat Energy's um, um, uh, rig number. What does it say there? Number one. They have they have Ormat is the largest of the geothermal energy producers in Nevada, and they actually have three of their own drill rigs and they keep them busy between Nevada and California. They, they have a lot of production in Southern California also. So they, they uh, have two at least they keep busy all the time and the crews that go along with them. And those, those drill rigs can go down to 10,000 feet or so and case down to that depth also. So uses, um, there's more than just energy production here. You know, geothermal initially was used for thousands of years to heat and cool buildings and some industrial drying processes, which I'll show you. Uh, behind you, you actually see a binary geothermal plant in Nevada that was built in the last couple of years. Uh, up on the top here are the condensers, and these, and I'm gonna use this term later, are heat exchangers. And, and I'll explain a little bit about what those do here in just a moment. So the commercial uses, just a couple of slides here, of ones that I'm aware of. On I-80, if you're out there in the summertime east of Fernley, Sometimes you drive by the Olam plant and you smell onions because they truck onions out there from California and dry onions for those dried onion products that you buy in the store here. And, it, and for miles, it smells like dried onions out there. Good thing there's no neighbors, right? Another spot that you may have seen, the pepper mill in, in Reno, uh, right along Virginia Street, is actually geothermally heated, space heated, the entire casino. There's a couple of large um, um, geothermal production wells there is hot water. That hot water is pumped up from a geothermal resource that exists almost right in the center of Reno. There's some, some housing developments that are entirely geothermal heated on, on systems there. 
Um, but this one is actually in the parking lot right there. So if you're ever in the parking lot at the pepper mill, wander around and you'll see that and just visualize that there was one of those big drill rigs sitting on that not too many years ago when they drilled that well, but now it comes up and it goes underneath the asphalt and into the heat exchangers where they heat the building. I love this one. So we're gonna talk about this one a little bit because this is, this is how a geothermal binary plant works here. And it's just gonna repeat itself a little bit here, but it's a simple one and I got a more, a more detailed one there in a moment. So let's go back to the beginning. So there's your drill, drill production well, and there's your hot water coming up. It's going through a heat exchanger. That heat exchanger has, has uh, that's a shell and tube exchanger. So on one side you have the hot water going through these little brass tubes, and on the other side of that, you have, you have um, some type of what it's called moated fluid. And the moated fluid is a, is a fluid that boils at a lower temperature than water. That's really what's driven this industry in the last 20 years is, is the binary plant type design. The moated fluid for the early plants was RU-134, otherwise known as refrigerant your air conditioner, right? Okay, and, and the most recent ones are, are, uh, are organics, they're isopentane and butane. But what's important is you can pump this hot water up at say 270 degrees, that's a good number you know, of plants that I've seen. So it's just above boiling, but it's under pressure in that casing so it's not flashing. And as it stays under, under pressure and goes through these heat exchangers, what's removed at the exchangers is, is the heat. So it's exiting the heat exchanger at a lower temperature and the heat is going into that motive fluid that's on the shell side of the exchanger, which is boiling and forming steam and going into a turbine, there's the turbine blade, and spitting a generator to generate electricity. That's how binary plants work. Here's a, here's a little bit better one I like that I borrowed from Ormat. So here's your production well, right? And it goes through, these are the heat exchangers. You see it goes through the tube side. There's actually two of them here. The motive fluid is, is the organic that boils at a lower temperature than water. And as it heats up, there it's boiling here, right? So it's going into steam phase and then it's spinning a turbine blade, converting mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the neat thing from a physics and thermodynamic standpoint, Geothermal is really cool because you're taking heat from the earth and making mechanical and then electrical energy from it. Changing, uh, changing the energy state three times. And then the hot water, let's say once again, it's, it's entering at maybe 270, if it's coming out here at, at 220 or something like that, still under pressure, and then it's going back into the earth. And this is then the hot rocks and it, and the, the interesting thing of the reservoir engineering part of that because uh, some of the companies have gotten very much into this because these, these geothermal systems do cool off with time. You don't change the locations of the wells, go deeper with them, move them around a little bit because you are, you know, you're taking heat out of the rock there. It's very, very slow, but with time they'll drop a, a half a degree Fahrenheit a year or something like that. So in order to better understand those, some of the companies have done tracer tests and they'll put some kind of very low um, concentration tracer like fluorescein dye or something like that into, into the re-injected solution and then they'll look for that on the production well. And I've, I've seen them as, as short as like nine days uh, between you know, re-injection and production of the same water that's going in that's, that's coming back up, so they're literally recirculating systems. Rich, is that anomalously rapid? I mean, would you yes, say? it is. Yeah. That is, yeah. That was, that was at Biowawi here uh, um, a couple of years ago, and it was, to, it was two wells, it was a production well that was closest to the, re, to the injection well, but that's usually where they start to just see, are we gonna get any of this fluorescein dye back anywhere? And, and they did, and then I thought that was really interesting, though. Um, that's, you know, that's the part of the, the business that, that, um, that they call reservoir engineering. I mean, they would call that an oil, oil the same, understanding what's going on down there. Yes? So in that situation where you're finding that your deposited, um, you know, cool geothermal fluid is 
you're finding that die again in a couple of days, does that increase the longevity of that geothermal project or does it actually kind of decrease it? Because I could see pulling hot water out, mm -hmm. you know, lowering, lowering the temperature, but then putting that cooler hot water back into it, does that kind of increase that heat loss? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with the dye. They're just looking to see how long that takes, okay. right? If you put the cool geothermal fluid back into the system of... If you're putting it in too close, then yes, you're going to drive the temperature down. So, so once again, you go, they go back to geology and, and say, okay, we think the fault is here. This is where our production wells are. Um, here's where our reinjection wells are. I mean, in, in the initial drilling of these fields, they don't know whether they're going to be production or reinjection wells. They're usually completed with the same configuration as far as the steel and the casing and so forth, so they could be used with either. And, and as time goes on and they start to understand where the hottest rock is coming, or where the hottest water is coming from, because that's really what it comes down to, which well produces the most flow at the highest temperature, that's probably going to be your production well, or one of them. A typical electrical geothermal plant like this of 20 or 30 megawatts might have five to 10 wells, production wells, and maybe uh, half as many reinjection wells. So, so they'll, so oftentimes then they'll move back away and drill the reinjection wells further away to try and extend the resonance time <coughs> down there. And, and it's you know once the once it's in production, they learn as they go. You know, plants that have been in production for 20 years are still looking at that and drilling new wells uh, to try to fine tune that and, and maximize the, the, the resource down there. Yes? So are the injection wells generally drilled as deep as the production wells? Or? Oftentimes they are. Sometimes they're not, sometimes they are. Sometimes they're deeper, but they, they need to go back into the reservoir somewhere, okay. somehow with as long of a uh, resonance time as they can. That's actually, as I, I've read, I haven't had anything to do with the geysers in many years, but one of the issues of the geysers has become, after 30 or 40 years of production, um, and the geysers was a superheated steam geothermal resource. I mean, when they drilled wells there, remember, you know, the steam came up, you know, above the line. It was, it was dry steam. And often that steam was then vented. It wasn't re-injected. And the resources now become depleted of water and they're having to inject water into the geysers to get water back into the system because they, they vented it for so many years. Yes? Does the uh, flow rate of the production well depend on uh, how hard you pump into the injection well? Hmm. I would describe it as different than that. I mean, a plant would be designed for X many gallons per minute, right? That of a certain temperature. So, so the production well, um, they're going to test the production well to look at the yield of the well such that it can maintain a, a certain static water level. Because when you start a water well, you pull a cone of depression, right? And, and you want to have it static someplace there. You don't want it to continually pull down to the point of where you're over pumping the well. So you're powering a pump to suck Yes. Okay. Yes, and I'll show you one of those. I've got a picture of a production and a and a reinjection well standing next to each other to show because some some of them they're configured differently. Anyway, makes sense. Yeah, a lot of thermodynamics there in that. I think the, these were the early systems <laughs> here. Um, the first mm -hmm. oh, 10, 15 years, and this this kind of is representative of, of what the geysers was too. So. This isn't one of the, it, unfortunately not video, but you have, you have your production well here, and the, the um, hot water was brought to the surface, uh, pumped to the surface, and then it was put into a flash steam vessel where you took the pressure off, right? So if you have hot water at, say, 300 degrees, and it's at 50 PSI, thereabouts, you know, it's, it's still going to be uh, under pressure like that. It's not gonna flash, but once you take the pressure off of it, the, the water flashes into steam, right? So the steam, the steam vessels then uh, collected the steam and went through and ran the turbines, and then they would uh, have condensers on the tail end of that. That's much like the technology of how a coal-fired power plant works, steam going in and then condensers after the, after the turbines. And then the 
the further to that, then you have recirculating cooling towers cooling the water. Um, and that's, there's a number of those plants still operating that way. Um, they, have, they have some maintenance issues with them because as you flash steam with minerals in here, there's a lot of scaling, calcium carbonate scaling and silica scaling because those things all of a sudden hit their saturation curve and start forming on the pipes and the vessels. And the other part about that is you have consumptive use of water where the binary systems, you're pumping water out and you're putting water back in. So, so most of those plants in the last 10 years that are that way have no consumptive use of water. The water's all going back into the ground. And in Nevada, water is precious and you would have to have a water right for that. So, so it, it helps them with that. And it also helps them keep a balance in the system without having to add additional water if they're, if they're uh, uh, using some of the water in the process. Yes, Hannah. No, not to any great extent that I've seen. And that's, you know, they, those systems run at very high reliability uh, and, uh, because, of, because of that, because they keep, keep the hot water under pressure. I'm sure there's some, but nothing to the scale, so to speak, of this, because I've seen this uh, out there where they have to shut down for weeks and descale the pipes and so forth before they start back up. But by keeping it under pressure, you never actually flash things and force it into saturation. So. So that's a flash system, and there's a number of those around. There's a number of those in California, too. Um, and there are some that are hybrid systems that, with time, as the flash systems, as the reservoirs cool, they actually added binary systems onto the back of them, and those are called bottoming units. And if you pass on Vibrati Hot Springs on I-80 east of Fernley, that's actually one of those, an old flash plant where they added a binary plant to the tail end and brought the, the output of electrical energy back to its original so they're getting quite, quite, uh, quite crafty at, at this technology that's evolved over the last 30 years. A question for you, yeah. right in that. Are geothermal plants measured in terms of efficiency, like coal and gas fired power plants are, in terms of there's a certain amount of energy that's going in, how much energy do you get out versus not? I, I'm not, you know, I don't think that number, I'm, you could calculate that obviously with, with the temperature change, you know, what you have hot, the, the temperature of the water coming in and the temperature coming out from an efficiency standpoint. But no, not, that's not necessarily one that they look at on a regular basis there as far as the efficiency of coal in a boiler right. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the heat exchangers have an efficiency to them. What is significant in that is binary plants are are very, um, their output, they have a boilerplate output in megawatts, right, and then in megawatt hours on an annual basis is what they're designed to. <clears throat> after they after they discover the reserve and drill it out and figure out how much water they have, then they design the plant, right, because you have to design the plant for, for how much water and how much heat and the temperatures that are, that are there. They operate much more efficiently in the winter than they do in the summer. And some of them, the output is almost double in the winter as it is in the summer. And that's because of the efficiency of the condensers and the outside temperature. Right. So the motor fluid that, that, it, that is heating up and flashing to steam and going through that turbine goes through all those fans, right? And it goes back to being a liquid. And in the summer, that's not so efficient. And in the winter, it is. So their, their efficiency goes up a lot the colder it is. And they have to actually plan for that, and their downstream receivers of the power do also. The flash plants are more efficient because open recirculated cooling is, is actually more efficient. You're going to get a, a cooler condensate out of, out of that, mm -hmm. depending on what you're using. So there's a balance there on it. Um, but not necessarily energy efficiency based on how many BTUs per right. million decatherms of gas, like you would think of in a, in a gas future or something like that. So there's this last year, there was actually three active areas, and, and they're actually pretty close together. It's a little dot right here that you see between Pershing and Churchill County. Uh, there's uh, two developing geothermal fields, one at Dixie Valley and one at Tungsten Mountain that are being drilled out. Reno is out this way. This is the town of Fallon, Nevada, so this is Highway 50 that you see going through here. You can actually see the drill rig at Tungsten Mountain. It's, it takes them about you know, six weeks to drill and complete one of those wells, and then they'll move it over to the next platform and drill another one. The 
geologists will take all the data and kind of work, work through to see what the next step is and where the next drill hole should be. And then one down here, close to Fallon, um, at Carson Lake, and that's also the site of the Forge project, which I'll talk about here in a minute, which is a, a research type related project that DOE's funding. So this is Tungsten Mountain. So beautiful Nevada, I love Nevada so much. You see the playa out there in the middle. Um, and this is one of our Matt's rigs at Tungsten Mountain because this is, this is their, their, uh, their play. It's on federal ground. So Nevada is 85% federal, federal land administered by the BLM and the Forest Service. So, so an entity can go and nominate a lease and then there's a competitive billing, bidding process for a block of land that they think would have geothermal energy on it. Once they have a federal lease on that, then they have certain obligations to drill with time and they have a royalty that they would pay the federal government on the production out there. But big expanses of federal land, not many neighbors, which is uh, I think why we're a big mineral resource state and not much rainfall actually either, as you can see. Uh, this is uh, the Dixie Hope um, field. And this is also an ORMAT rig. Those, those two are ORMAT projects there. They seem to be the most active player uh, in geothermal right now. Uh, they're also the designer of the original binary plant. They'll sell, they'll sell the design to anyone. They make them in modular and they actually bring them in and click, 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 and the plant is, is together. So these are going to be plants that are somewhere around 20 to 30 megawatts. Um, compare and contrast that to a typical, say, gas peaking plant. Um, if you're familiar with those, usually those are about 250 a piece or a coal fired power plant about 250 megawatts for two units so they're not huge generators in the, in the context of, of uh, the fossil fuel plants but if you start adding them up they start to, to add up to a fair amount of kilowatts a couple years ago Enel Green Energy um, built what what is now called you know the, the first uh, hybrid plant this is their Stillwater plant which went into production in in 1987 and has been in production ever since and since you know they they uh, knew that they were already connected to the, the transmission grid they decided to build solar fields there too I know they got some subsidies for that but they actually put in 240 acres of solar field because they could connect it to the power lines that were already there and that was a synergy they didn't have they didn't have to do that so I think we'll probably see some more of that with with time and, and a lot of that is driven by the price of of stringing transmission lines, um, which is getting more and more expensive to permit and more and more expensive to, to build. So the first of the hybrid plants out there, and that, that as I said, is enough to power about 15,000 households. And here's my picture of a production well and a reinjection well that just happened to be really close together. So which one's the production well? Small one. vertical turbine pump on it, right? This one, some, some of these are, are big submersible pumps, the, most, but the majority of them are vertical turbine pumps, so they, they spin shaft, just like a big irrigation well that you would see out there. And then, and then in this case, because this, this goes out several thousand feet, they don't even have to, to have much pressure behind it to reject it, it's just going right back into the formation, receiving it. So, this is, this is kind of the, the couple stories here in this, in this graph. This is uh, one that I like to use a lot to, to, to talk about the geothermal energy in Nevada because it started in 1985. I actually got to be at the first plant, second plant that went online in 1986. And you can see the growth because on the right axis here, or the left axis, excuse me, that's thousands of megawatt hours of power produced. So that's your measure of how much it's, it's produced. Uh, in megawatt hours, not the, not the boilerplate or instantaneous production, uh, but what they're actually paid on. And you see that that climbed rather rapidly back in the 80s and early 90s when there was initially a number of plants that went online. And then through the 90s, things kind of languished. There wasn't much exploration. There wasn't too many new plants that were built. It was pretty flat. And then we hit 2008. And, and to some extent, you know, I have, I have to say this was, this was driven a bit by subsidies, and it was driven by by some state requirements that their power grid be some percentage of green power. And I mean, geothermal is, is really the true, truly the only base load green power that's, that's out there, right, as a, as a renewable. I mean, we can, 
talk solar and wind, and I like both of them, but solar's good when the sun shines and wind's good when the wind blows. And that's not base load, because somebody then at night, if you're using solar, has to fire up a fossil fire plant to, to make up the difference when everybody's actually using it, because there's no batteries in the grid to store power. But geothermal is base load. And since then, we've seen one or two new plants go online uh, each year, and also the efficiencies of the existing plants as the operators become better at managing the reservoirs and the plants themselves to pump. So, so the production in Nevada is now a little over 3.1 million megawatt hours, which is second to California. California still makes more, um, but it's enough to power 284,000 single family homes, there, which is about 25% of the power in Nevada. So for capital-wise, we're by far the biggest producer of green energy in the nation per capita. The white line is another story here. And, and this is the economic story, as, 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 as that explains so much of things. So it's on the right axis here, and it's what the power producers are receiving in cents per kilowatt of power. So when you get your electric bill, right, you open it up and it says you used this many kilowatts last month and this is the charge for that, right? And it's probably 12, 15 cents or something like that if you look at it. I like to look at my bill every month just to see how much. And there's usually varied rates depending on the public utility commission. But this is the blended rate for all of them. They, they don't have to report that. I actually calculate it from a gross proceeds number. So it's not quite eight cents a kilowatt. And, and what's other significant there is if you go way back here, you look at it, it was much higher when there was a lot of growth, and then it faltered, and then we had uh, something I can't hardly explain, but it had to do with that energy crisis when Gray Davis lost his job, if you sort of remember those years there. And then, and then we've had this steady climb, but not a rapid climb of what they get. I mean, if they were receiving a much higher value for their, for their uh, power, they would be building more plants, doing more exploration. So why is that line flat? So, but that's for Nevada. That's that's not a a national average. So, so that's for Nevada. So could that be impacted by some of these larger plants that went in? Some of the nah, in? not really, because because it, you know, as far as how, how much it produces total, Nevada imports and exports, and the grid that you have out there. You know, if if power is cheaper in Utah, the power company in Nevada is going to import it from Utah. If, if power is cheaper in Nevada, then the power the power distributor in California is going to import it from Nevada. They move across boundaries east easily, and it's a very, very sophisticated economic you know model. You're going to buy the cheapest kilowatts that you can get to deliver to your customers. They're required by the PUC to do that. What what is the highest uh, as far as the fuel goes? What's the what's the highest um, percent production of electricity generated in the state generated by what fuel? Natural gas. The country. Oh, also. Natural yeah, natural which one? Natural, natural gas. Right. Just, just past coal. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, way, it's a ways past coal now, yeah, because coal's come down, it's around the third now. And, and what has natural <laughs> gas done during this period? Shale gas. You know, I, I remember Back, back here, you know, working for the mining company at the time, we were all worried as to whether we were going to have any power because of the Enron debacle and so forth. And natural gas got up to about $10 per million BTU. It's between $2 and $3 now. Shale gas drove that because it's cheap, the cheapest thing to make energy out of. And that's my point being, that's kind of holding this back, but that's economics of any business, right? In due time, um, when, when gas goes back up, they'll be paying more here, and you'll see more movement in this, in this industry again. But at least it's growing uh, steadily right now. So what you really mean is fracking. Because shale gas wouldn't happen without Yeah, right. Yep. Does Nevada have a goal for renewables? No. They have, they have a they have a in the energy which is the energy supplier has a legislatively mandated number that they throw out there but it's 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 been achieved already california has a much higher one so a lot of this geothermal power we're producing here is actually going to california 
and I'll, I'll show you where that is here in just a moment. This is the power grid, the other part of the business that, that really defines where you're going to explore. So you see the boundaries of the state of Nevada, and this is the major power grid, right? This is the big lines that you see with the three phases. These are 120 kV lines, not the ones that go to your neighborhood or little towns here and there that don't have the capacity to carry a lot. And that's well defined in the I-80 corridor up here, particularly well defined up here because these are all mines and mining areas that are active. This is the Carlin Trend and the Gold Districts and the Copper Mines and the Barite Mines, and they've been connected, so they drove the grids there years ago. Central Nevada, going across here, the, the Highway 50 corridor. This is the test site you know, here, so there's nothing there uh, because it's all, all uh, Air Force Base and, and uh, closed off. So the power grid in much of Nevada, as you can see, isn't really well done or isn't really well interconnected. So there's actually a lot of places that, that even if there was a great target, uh, if it's 100 miles from tying into the power grid, how are you going to get the electricity there? And it costs about a quarter of a million dollars a mile to run power lines from one of these plants. So in some cases, the power lines could cost more than the plant and the wells. And, and as that power grid fills in, that's that opens up new areas literally for exploration. That goes back to that map of the fairway that I showed you earlier that's overlaying in there of areas that realistically you could run power lines. This is a chronology of geothermal plants in, in the state that we did for the Geothermal Resource Conference. The exploration actually started back in the 50s, but it was mostly looking for hot water dehydration. Um, the city of Elko, where I lived for many years, heats a lot of the municipal buildings and the pool and the schools with geothermal heat because they have geothermal exploit and then the first plants back in the 80s and then you can see the names of the plants that came uh, after that right up to 2016. Here's where those plants are, all the two of them because this is a couple years old and two of them went on last year. A lot of them around the Reno area and the Walker Lane and out along I-80 which kind of is consistent with that that message of how far is it from a power transmission line the McGinnis Hills plant here, which is actually the largest plant, it's 100 megawatts. There's two units there now. It's close to the I, the Highway uh, 50 corridor there, so it wasn't the, that far. From. Is that the Grass Valley? Yes. Yep. North of Austin, the one that sits out there. So, so that kind of overprints it a, a little bit. And uh, the, the Division of Minerals is actually the permitting regulatory agency for drilling the geothermal uh, wells and the, and the conservation of the resource in the state. This is just permitted wells. Uh, how many permits we issued for production wells on a yearly basis in the green line is how many they were actually drilled. You can see it peaked back in about 2008. Manuel's wells permitted about half that many drilled. That's not atypical of companies. They'll permit way more than what they need so that when they're ready to move the rig, they've got a permitted hand to do it. And that's kind of come down here, but last year we actually saw a blip, and I think this year we'll see another blip up. I think it's turned the corner and we're going to see a little more activity there. This is a picture of the first plant at Wabuska, which is out of the, the town of Yarrington. That's when they were drilling the well, and uh, it, it's steam. There's no blowout prevention device on that that you can see. When you drill a geothermal well, you have to have that just like a gas well, so that if you start blowing steam up, you can shut the valves and it doesn't get away from you. Um, that was the actual power plant. It wasn't very big. It was a one megawatt plant, but that was the first first one in, in, uh, in Nevada. Yes? And those wells that continuously just blow steam, do you still build pumps onto those production wells? Oh yeah. Do you still do this kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yep, you do. Especially if it's a binary plant. Because if you're blowing steam, you're venting into the atmosphere, right? If you want a binary plant, you've got to keep that under pressure as water as you pump it up. Was there another question? I was going to ask about the graph on the two slides previous. Sure. With the permitted uh, wells, yeah. produced wells. Um, in 2015, how come the, the drill wells are higher than the permits? Because they had permits uh, that they were issued the year before that they used uh, this year. Yeah, permits are usually good for one or two years, and then they and then they can come back and renew them. You know, if they if they want. What's we the, just we just want to look at how many they're drilling in a certain resource so they don't overdrill. What's okay. the blue line? Oh, the blue line is. Uh, uh, millions of megawatt hours. Sorry, it wasn't on there. Same thing that you saw earlier. The actual production, uh, about 3.1 million megawatt hours. Yeah, I was missing there. Oh, fix that slide. 
So and those two. And is, is that eight hour delay? Is that typical time it takes to build a plant? Eight hour delay. Or eight year. Sorry, not eight hour. Go back. Yeah. So you can see the wells are drilled in in 08, but then production goes up and peaks in 15. Yep. Well, I mean, I think I think what you see there is is okay, the the production was flat until 2007. Obviously, they started drilling some wells here. Those might have been wells in existing plants that added to their capacity, or it might have been new plants. But there is a delay there from production to from the drilling of the well to the plant being built, and that's two three years usually. You know, it takes them a while to drill the wells and then add them all up and then you got to design the plant and fabricate and make the components and then build it. Okay, that's the Biwawi plant. That was that's really the first big plant in Nevada. That's that's uh, out in uh, Lander County. I actually saw the the groundbreaking of that and the day it started up in 1985. It's kind of fun to, to look at it again because it hasn't changed much out there. It was found, it was a big hot spring system in there. These are the seven seven companies that operate geothermal plants in Nevada and what their uh, gross electrical production, gross and net electrical production, that is a number that you that you, that you can look at, whether it's a coal-fired power plant or a gas plant or one of these. The, the turbines, the turbine spins into the generator and you produce gross electrical production. But what you ship down the electric lines is net because you're using some of the energy internally to run the pumps and to run the you know the system, but mainly mainly the pumps and so forth. So they consume some of their own power, gross and net. So future trends and, and challenges: uh, co-location of solar and geothermal transmission expansion. So it'll open up new exploration areas. Optimizing reservoirs. Um, the last few plants that went in were were of a certain size, and as they kept drilling, they found that they had more capacity, so they add more plants of similar size, uh, phased development of the resource. The research and development part of that has been funded by DOE, and the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology actually has one, one area that they were successful, and that's the area up by Fallon's <coughs> called the Forge Project Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, and that's, that's what I was talking about, of trying to develop fracturing in the rock, secondary permeability to allow water to move through it. Um, California also has a site, as I understand, and I think that's Coso, down off of 395. That's in, in they initially look at certain things and they shrink it down as they, as they do some drilling and testing to see um, if there's one particular area that, that those uh, research monies can, can actually make a difference. Public lands permitting in Nevada is getting harder because there's always some mineral withdrawal from, from various, for various different reasons that, you know, the most recent was 2.8 million acres along the northern border for the sage grouse, and for 20 years now it's locked up. So uh, they, can't, they can't lease, they can't do anything up there. During that period, about 60% of the wells are on private, 40% are public. Nevada has about 430 active geothermal wells right now as of last month. This is our web page as the permitting agency. You can look at the statutes and the regulations on geothermal. There's some there's some pretty good presentations that we'll plug in there. Feel free to use them if you have a reason to do that. It's all public data, so you're welcome to use the slides or anything that's in there. And and other information and data that we that we put on the website that I think is helpful to the public and industry. And then my final slide I put together thinking about it last night because I wish somebody would have done this for me when I was an undergraduate. So what kind of degrees or skills would you need to work in this business? And these are my thoughts right out of my head. Somebody else might di differ with me a little bit, but from my years in the, in the industry out there, well, from an exploration standpoint, uh, and, and you know, reservoir engineering, geologists, and I would recommend some economic geology background because these are typically epithermal systems, so under, understanding that, and alteration in rocks and so forth is, is, is important. Hydrogeology is a must. You gotta understand how water moves through the rocks. Global information systems, it's pretty hard anymore. If you come out, you're gonna have to learn this quick anyway, Esri's art view, because it's used for just about everything. Mapping, uh, surface, um, air photos, and so forth like that. Geophysics and database management, because there's a lot of database, you know, drill hole data and so forth. You haven't used MS Access, that's 
that's the standard database that comes with that package, learning to use that is a good. On the development and production side, mechanical, electrical engineers, typically those are the plant managers and designers of the plants. And on the permitting side, because geothermal plants, just like mines, have compliance people that, that uh, understand how to permit these things and understand the compliance that's required, because these plants have water rights that you have to report on. They have air permits, they have surface to surface permits and all of those things that, that uh, are required to run in any industrial plant. And those people usually are the keepers of those, the, the, environmental, uh, the environmental department. And now on the operations side, and I can't overemphasize this enough because this is where the majority of people are in this, is plant operators, instrument techs, electricians, and mechanical maintenance people. Lots of people who come out of uh, technical schools, two year degrees and so forth that come with those skills. That's where the majority of the, the head counts are in, in most things that, that uh, relate to geothermal out there. And I think that's all I have, so I hope that was useful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any questions?